my name is uh, Peter Redgrave. I've been here, I'm a neuroscientist, I work in the psychology department, and I've been here a very long time, 1976 was when I came to Sheffield, and somehow I got persuaded by Sandrine here to do this lecture. I don't know how it happened, well I do know how it happened, because one one time I was invited to give a talk in the, uh, in the University of uh, California, San Francisco, and you give your talk, but then they, were, uh, they asked me to go to lunch with you guys, their graduate students, and, uh, you know, they, they were supposed to entertain me with talk and this kind of stuff. And I told them that one year, years ago that I was a graduate student in America, but I quit because of it. <coughs> and they said, what? What happened? And I told them about the story that I'm going to tell on my slides, I'll tell you about it. But they were absolutely fascinated by this. And I think Sandrine somehow got to hear about that. And that is how I came to be here today. Now, ethical issues. There are two sorts. In science, there are two main classes of ethical issues. The ethics of prosecuting science doing it. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in this lecture. Hypothesis, experiments, get results, interpret the data, present the work for publication, the prosecution of science. But there's also, and I think we should all be very much aware of this, that knowledge is power. And whatever we discover can be used by others for good or ill. And it seems to me quite important, although it's not, I have a few slides at the end um, which addresses this point, but I think it's very important that we do realize the power that we scientists give politicians and the like. And I think we should have an informed opinion on the rights and wrongs of how what we discover are used. So, the plan today, I'm going to talk to you about right and, right and wrongs in science. I'm going to talk about the flavours of malpractice. <laughs> I'm then going to tell you what happened in America, misconduct, and the pressures to be bad, pressures to be good. And then I'm going to give you some practical advice on being good. Right and wrong. <laughs> Would it were so simple? It's not. There are in all kinds of situations. We're talking about various shades of grey. And we all have to come to a personal decision where our limits are. <coughs> Look at the quote down the bottom. Show me someone with a perfectly clean record who's able to get anything done. That's it. That's a pernicious attitude. But it's quite common out there. So, why can't we all be completely honest? Because there's all kinds of conflicts of interest. It's what we have to do is to behave as honestly as we possibly can. It's, it's really hard. Even when you are doing your absolute best to play it straight, your unconscious will be playing games with you. In psychology, this is known as the experimental effect. People it's been shown in studies that if people expect 
or want a particular outcome to their experiment, somehow it gets nudged that way. And it is for that reason that the, the pharmaceutical companies have, uh, and also pharmacology um, investigations in universities, they use double-blind procedures. So the person giving the drug doesn't know what drug they are giving, and the person receiving the drug doesn't know what they're receiving. When you analyze data, it is often really good not to know from which groups the data come from. Just simply to avoid unconscious experimental bias. So you're doing your level best to do it straight and unconsciously. And this is why people bring in these procedures. However, it is really, there are all kinds of conflicts of interest that I'm going to be talking about. Um, here it says, the experience of life is that small breaches of honesty, it's like a wedge of cheese, it's a slippery slope. If you're a little bit dishonest here, it's kind of easier to be a little bit dishonest the next time. And if you're dishonest about a little thing, next time it's a little bit easier to be dishonest about a medium-sized thing, and so on. The funding agencies, NIH here, but also now, all the big conferences, when you give a talk, you have to sign a declaration of interest for, that you have to have on your slide, saying, I am a consultant for Merck Sharp and Dom, big drug company. I am a consultant for whatever. I am getting money from these people. So that the audience knows where there may be some little biases creeping in. So the idea here is that wherever conflicts of interest, I don't know whether you can read this, but it is a wonderful cartoon here. It says, the con conflict of interest statement. The senior author's promotion and the first author's job depend on this study. It's true. We will see. It's true. Okay, let's, let's think about the flavours of malpractice. How the different ways in which it is known that some people cheat. Fabrication, falsification, plagiarism. Falsification, a student's tale. This is what happened when I, this was the straw, this is the guy, Robert D. Myers, they say <coughs> you should never speak ill of the dead. He died, I think it was last year, but I'm going to ignore that. <laughs> he was horrible man, he was a really horrible man. And he was also a cheat. This is the straw. I've got lots of Meyer stories, but this is the one that broke the camel's back as far as I was concerned. What actually what he, I'll tell you what he, the sort of stuff that he did. All right. <laughs> this guy had a very clear idea. He had a, a theory, a hypothesis of how the world works. And he was certain he was right. My fundamental failure as a graduate student was my complete inability to find data that supported his theory, okay. which was part of my downfall. I can remember. No problem. I only just remembered to turn mine off at the beginning. <laughs> I would get some data. It would, I worked on temperature regulation, so zero, <coughs> or body temperature. <laughs> I 
I'd get some data and he would come in and he would say things like, um, how, how did it go today? Well, it went very well. I've got this result. And um, I don't know about that. What was the uh, what was the temperature of the room? What do you mean? What's the temperature of the room? It's what it's always is. It's set on the it's set on the thermostat. It's all it's always the same. <clears throat> what do you mean? You didn't measure the temperature of the room? Can't we can't have those data? Following day, new experiment, new data. Happened. Well, perfect. Fits the theory. Wow, great data, Peter. Really good data. You, you're doing really well now, Sean. You're doing really well. But why didn't you ask me about the temperature room? Oh, you don't need to worry about that. <laughs> I've got some slides. Cherry picking the data, that's called. Okay. What? I was young, I was naive, I'm working on body temperature, the baseline is falling, how stupid of I was, I should have waited it to start coming back up, or to level out or whatever, but I made the injection here, and that's what I got. He came in and said, I tell you what, how much better would it be if we moved the point of the injection site? Little, tiny, you know, the effect was big. It almost certainly did cause a fall in body temperature. And I thought, sorry, I'm out of here. And I quit. I tried to come. But it was really tricky because this guy was a major figure. I was your age. And obviously you couldn't ask. I've been there two years. I couldn't ask, for, ask him for a reference. What the hell do you do? When you get into a situation, you, you've you got a two-year gap that you can't account for. I went, I went, I was working in Bob Mars's lab. And, uh, yeah, yeah, well, how did you do there? Can I contact him? Well, actually, I'd rather you didn't. I had to go back to the university where I did my undergraduate work, where they knew... I was okay, and I was able to get my PhD there. And I only had two years to do it, and I did it. So, that is falsification, a student's tale. I came here, 1976, <coughs> and I was a young guy. This would never happen now. But I was, well, I had a friend in one of the big drug companies and he asked if one of the guys that worked in his lab could come and work here in Sheffield, do a PhD with me. His name was Russell. Russell came and Russell was fully trained. He'd worked in a drug company for something like 10 years or so. So he knew all the techniques. Okay. All he needed to do is do the work. And this is the bit that would never happen now. I would ask Russell, how's it going? Russell would say, great, really well, really good. And, oh, the animals, they all did this and it, it's going really well. Good project. Just like, you know. And I didn't inquire in detail any further. He wrote up his PhD and one of the chapters now you, you have to think about this alright in the method section subjects 37 males and 35 females the purpose of the experiment was to see if drug X, doesn't matter what it is would suppress the behaviour evoked by another drug called apomorphine. When you give rats this second drug, apomorphine, it elicits two responses. Yawning, 
and grooming the penis. That's what it does. In fact, I'm sorry, that's what the drug does. And that was, that's what you measured. How much of the two behaviours you've got. Then the examiner, he, go, <coughs> went, into the, he went into the viva, and the examiner was just waiting for his question. So you ran your subjects in pairs then? Let's think about it. He failed outright because the whole lot didn't have a data. He made up the whole data. Or the, a large part of this data set he'd made up. Um, with police interviews, Right, they suspect a criminal. No, I'm not. <coughs> Examiners are actually testing the same thing. What the police do is ask you, if you're a suspect, to go over the details of your alibi over and over again. Because if you're telling lies, it's ever so difficult to keep the story completely straight. That is why, in your viva, the examiners may very well ask very <coughs> detailed questions of method. How did you do the data? How did, how did you actually do that experiment? <coughs> what volume of whatever it is did you use? What concentration did you use? Because it, if somebody... You have to be on top. If you did it, you would be on top of that material. And one of the one of the questions that as an examiner, one of the, how much of the what I'm reading in the thesis did the student actually do? And that's why they ask those kinds of questions. Russell failed outright. That was it. That's just a, a small guy at the university. This guy, he actually, Wakefield, he linked this MMR vaccine with autism, with a fraudulent study. It's still having an effect today. Last year in Swansea, there was kids getting chicken pox or whatever it is, mumps, measles, because they are now grown up from, they, they, they did not get their kids vaccinated, and there are all kinds of problems. So, there can be very serious impact of fraudulent <coughs> um, science. Other examples, plagiarism. That's a, plagiarism, an act of presenting another work Another person's work or ideas as your own. Look at this guy. He, he gets grants to review. Some, you know, as, as academics, we put in grants to the funding agency to get our research funding. The funding agency sends them out to review. So I would get a you know, somebody that works in neuroscience has applied for the grant for the MRC, I would get the grant to review. What this guy did, turned down the grant, thinking, ooh, that's a good idea, I will do that. And that's what he did. Okay, that is an extreme form of plagiarism. It's always very good to when you are writing your background material, acknowledge the research that was done that has led up to your study. Okay? Acknowledge the people who did it by name. <coughs> Sometimes when you are copying material, if you just copy large chunks of the original data out, it's not that great. Much better to put it into your own words. Down this end of the scale, 
what you do is pay somebody else to write something for you. <laughs> Has it occurred to you where I'm getting all this material from? <laughs> the World Wide Web is an amazing place. It just makes preparing lectures um, and talks like this so much easier. You just type in scientific cheating. <laughs> Other examples of misconduct confidentiality. It's interesting this. There, you go to some laboratories in the world, nobody talks to each other. Why not? Because they're frightened that somebody is going to steal my ideas and do experiments <coughs> or do whatever. It's incredible. So I think it's more prevalent in America, but I bet, I, I'm sure it goes on here as well. And um, if you are in a really high profile area which has commercial outcomes, you want to get your results out first before a competing group. And if you find that somebody has been telling the competing group some vital information, it's not good. However, <laughs> I'm a blabber man. It's quite, it, it, it's, my experience has always been, maybe this because in neuroscience, it's not, the kind of stuff that I do is not, has no commercial, serious commercial implications, not immediately in any way. So I have always felt that as soon as I get <coughs> some kind of idea or whatever, I will tell anybody that is sit, prepared to sit down and listen. And I think the reason for that is, you know, the costs. If it's a brilliant idea, somebody could go and do the same experiment. However, the benefits, if it's a bad idea, or if somebody knows of some data that will support your idea, it starts to become more collaborative, and you can get a lot of very good ideas. <coughs> from other people you tell about your work, but even more important, if it's a crap idea, they can say, you know what you just said? Well, so-and-so did an experiment I know about. Can't possibly be right. The sooner you know that you're wrong, the better. <laughs> because you can imagine, you go <coughs> further, forward, 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 further and further forward, so you're standing up at a big fancy international meeting and you say, oh, this is my hypothesis or this is my theory, blah, blah, blah. And the guy that you could have spoken to in the coffee bar two years ago puts his hand up at the back and says, hang on a minute, what about so-and-so's data which shows that you can't possibly be right? In front of a huge big audience. That would not be good. So, in all minds, my, I think you stand more to gain by sh sharing <coughs> stuff than trying to keep it other people out. <laughs> Economy with the tr truth. Okay. It's quite interesting, this. People, to protect... Again, I think there's big commercial interests involved. To protect their commercial stuff, they sometimes either omit critical bits of procedure, which makes it very difficult for people, other scientists, to replicate. And quite frankly, what sets science out as the best game in town for understanding how the world works is that if you do something and somebody does enough the same as you, they will get the same result. So, in principle, 
everything that you do must essentially be able to be replicated and extended by other people. To prevent that, people are sometimes economical with the truth. They don't tell the whole story. This is what I was saying a little bit uh, about earlier. This is a very case. I'm not going to. This is a very famous case. Is this going to be up on mall? Okay, so you can you can you can have a look at this. Basically, Watson and Crick got the Nobel Prize for discovering or identifying the structure of the double helix. They didn't do any experimental work. Rosalind Franklin did a whole stack of fundamental experimental findings that Watson and Crick put together. Dr. Franklin's results, which they obtained without her knowledge from an unpublished report she had written for her research director. No mention of Franklin's key contributions occurs in their nature paper. We all know scientists, like everybody else, are human beings. There are bad apples. What's the response of other scientists to the cheats? Look at this guy. I no longer put in the most original ideas into my research proposals because of the problems that I just mentioned. The, the reviewer gets to see it and he's often running before the guy gets funded or if he doesn't get funded, the reviewer's got a free hand to go, you know. Look what these guys are doing. What they do is they, when they're submitting their paper for review, what they do is they put in some deliberate mistakes so that people, before they publish it, people can't, the reviewers or the editors or whatever can't somehow use that information to get a study out or get, yeah, to, to, um, to exploit their work before the authors get the credit. So what they do is put in deliberate mistakes and only when they get the proofs, the last stage before publication, do they put the correct data in. I'm afraid, signs, and this is because we will see the pressures to be bad. I'll talk about them in a minute. Signs that all is not well. Retractions are up. Okay. These are the dates, and these are fraud, fabrication, scientific mistakes, other. I don't know what other are. But all the way across through the first ten years of this decade. And what's the higher the impact factor? In other words, the Glamour magazine, Science and Nature, the retraction rate is higher. Mm -hmm. So that's the explanation. However, what is, I think, more significant, the drug companies know that research is phenomenally expensive. Therefore, they hire, they, they ha have staff in the big drug companies, my mate Greg Martin was one, his job was to survey the literature, look out for papers published by scientists that were likely to be of relevance to the drug company. He would tell his colleagues in the drug company about that, and they would say, well, okay, yes, it is relevant to us. Let's try and replicate this study before testing our drugs on it. Bayer is one of the big drug companies. And basically, 64% were failed replications. And the reasons given 
are the pressures on scientists now to be done. That's what we're going to talk about now. Professional competition. It's turning more and more into a winner-take-all game. To them that hath more will be given, to them that hath not, that which they hath will be taken away. My goodness me. That shows that uh, I went to church regularly until I was 16. Um, to survive professionally, the people who look at, do the hiring, or look at the funding agencies, the guys, the reviewers, or the, the editors, or the, the people on the boards of the funding agencies, they look at the papers and they look at where they're published. Are they published in the high impact factor? And quite frankly, to get an academic position now, certainly in the top universities, Papers published in science, nature, in my area, neuron, nature neuroscience. If you haven't got papers published in those journals, it's much harder to get an interview than if you have. Another, why has this happened? There's hundreds of you. <coughs> when I, in back in the 70s, when I was doing the new people coming in would be maybe 10, 20. Each department would have a handful of new year one postgrads. 73. More than 50% of biologists had 10, 10 year track job academic positions within six years of getting a PhD. By 2006, the figure was down to 50%. My advice, my strong advice, however good you think you are, have a plan B. Seriously. Because most of you, if we believe this figure, and I bet it's not got any better, most of you will get a job outside of academia. For sure. So all the time, think about plan B. Pressures to be back. Commercial pressures on universities all the time now. We are told this is a business. Students come in with a whacking great um, fee tattooed on their bottoms, so it's bums on seats. Okay. The amount of money the universities get from the government depends on the research productivity of their staff. Each staff member gets a number and they add the numbers up. The bigger the number, the more money the university gets from the government. Consequently, the pressure on the staff to publish in the glamour magazines is phenomenal. Basically, if you don't have funding, if you can't get funding, you don't get promoted. So there the pressure to make sure that your data are good enough to get in the glam mags Big pressure. Some places in the world pay their staff, personally, money, pay their staff to get papers published in the glam mags. How serious a conflict of interest is that? Down the bottom. This is true. Recent email turned up in my inbox. I might have a nice retirement job for you. Mohammed's institution wants to pay people in the West who have published science in the Glamag, Science and Nature. 
a monthly salary to advise them how to publish posh stuff. <laughs> you get some dosh, I'll have to pop over there now and again, all paid for. How do you get in, in a crowded world of science? How do you get your results noticed by anybody else? I mean, I go to the SFN, so the Society of Neuroscience in America. It's the, it's the World Neuroscience Meeting. There are 30,000 participants. More than turn up at Sheffield Wednesday football. It's incredible. Posters, 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 thousands of them. I don't know, you know, 12, 15,000 posters. How the hell do you get anybody to look at yours? Your marketing, your selling. You tend the pressure to put the best possible spin on what you've got is, is, um, is quite intense. And so, the implication of that, you often see in people's results section, this is a representative result. Pa. More likely to be the best. Pretty fancy dancy scientific meetings because in my area there was a big, big theory. It's <coughs> so big, you might even have read it about it in the newspapers. <coughs> the neurotransmitter dopamine equals reward. Whenever you do something that you like doing, there is dopamine squirting out in your brains. In 1999, I published a paper, a review paper in Trends of Neuroscience that questioned that view. I questioned the data on which that view was found. And you have to realise that scientists are just like kids in the playground. What happens in the playground when there's a fight? Everybody gathers around. They won't. So it's not a bad strategy. If you if there's one really big guy, big theory, and you think you found something wrong with it, whoa, that is a that is a, a career opportunity. <sighs> Go for it. Because it's true. They they have invited me to these conferences with the big guys and I They'd like to see a little scrap. However, <laughs> last year, when was it? 13, yeah, 2013. Actually, it was 2012. I was in Japan, and this guy, I was doing no harm to nobody. And this guy came into the lab and says, Pete, I think you should know about some data that I've just collected in my laboratory. He starts telling me about this, and about two minutes into him telling me, I realise that I'm wrong. All this over the last ten years or so, I've been saying dopamine can't be rewarding because there's a problem with the data collection. <laughs> he shows that my objection to it Honestly, it, it doesn't hurt to be wrong. And what's even more interesting is that these are the slides that I now present in my talk. When I go out with the talk, these are the slides. Okay? When I come up to this slide, you, are, you don't need to read what's on the slide, but you need... Red indicates a shift or modification of position. 
This is the bit that needs to be revised. Hold your ideas lightly because you never know when you have to put them down. Again, some revision is required. Be prepared to change your mind in the face of new evidence. I put these slides up at these big meetings. I have never seen anybody else do that. <coughs> People come up afterwards and shake my hand. Honestly, they think that it is, it is good. So honestly, it's not a problem to be wrong. General advice. This is a whole stack of things. This is from British government's chief scientific officer. Work carefully. Get skilled. Declare conflicts of interest, you know. Acknowledge the work of others. Don't, don't plagiarise. <laughs> Ensure your, result, your, your research doesn't break the law. Generally minimise the impact on people, animals and the environment. That's a good one. This is the point that I made at the beginning. Discuss issues. Discuss. Be prepared to have an opinion of how your, what are the implications for everybody of your results. And don't cheat. To which I would add a few little points as well. Keep good notebooks. Really keep good notebooks. Because... When you come to try and analyse your data and all this kind of stuff, and you can't quite remember exactly what you did, that is the perfect place where unintentional experimental bias can kick in. But if you've got it written down exactly what you did, it's much better. Don't quit while you're ahead quick when you're confident that you really understand what's going on. <laughs> Make sure you know about statistics. And if you don't know about them, get the help of somebody that does. Don't cherry pick, don't be economical with the truth. Be generous with authorship. If somebody has contributed to the study, I have fallen foul of this myself. Where I just I realised <coughs> way too late that a colleague of mine had provided some really important photographs for this study that I published, and I'd forgotten that he had given me those photographs, and that was 30 years ago. And he still reminds me about it. <laughs> so, <coughs> previous work. No, the previous work. And be a good, good lab citizen. Generous with time, advice, access to facilities. If you do all of these things, trust me, you will be happier than if you don't. Just very quickly, a few ethical issues outside this conduct. And it is important to have an opinion. <coughs> Respect for subjects. If you work with people or animals, well, we'll come to the animals in a minute. There are people with diminished autonomy. Don't exploit them. Informed consent. This is an incredible example. The specific goal of the study was to examine the progression of untreated syphilis in African Americans. They were never explained what the true nature of the study was, and they were denied treatment even when the antibiotics were shown to be effective. 
the study was not abandoned until 1972. Don't do research in the third world that will only benefit the first world. That's nasty. It's actually important, this. If you find people cheating, breaking the law, whatever, you actually do have an obligation to blame them. Well. Big ethical issue for me is the animal experiments. A lot of what we do in neuroscience involves animal experiments. The guidelines is very tightly regulated by the Home Office, whose general mission is to replace, refine and reduce. My personal example, or my personal view on this, is that there are two bad things that cause suffering. Human diseases and animal experiments. And the world so far is arranged that you cannot avoid both of them. If you, why, if you avoid one, you necessarily buy into the other. So it's just to a question of what do you find more morally offensive, human disease or animal experiments? You have to choose one. And um, for me, I don't even measure them on the same scale. There's all kinds of weird contemporary ethical stuff, genetic engineering, cloning, stem cell, virus research, whole stack of stuff. So, ethical issues are not other people's problems. They are problems, everybody's problems. Thank you for your attention. for you to discuss with people around you. So I want you to form groups of uh, four, so if you can turn around, and I want you to consider some of the, the issues that Pete's presented. And anyway, what is your, ex ex your own experience at the moment? I mean, most of the research is starting uh, this project. What is your own experience of some of these maybe ethical issues or good research practice issues? You know, what are the things that you may pick up from the presentation that you want to discuss and, and ask the panel? Okay. So I'm giving you 10 minutes to reflect on what has been presented and discuss you know, from you know, where you are now. You know, how is this relating to your, you know, your own experience of developing as a scientist? Okay. So from that's when you How many think? How many people think that today's lecture like wasn't relevant to? Them? Okay, no, no. Not a Can you tell me why? <laughs> tell me why. Um, because I don't work with any data. All the work that I do is theoretical. So I don't and, and has no consequence at all for the public? Um, I don't understand yet what consequence it has. I just started. So you don't think about what so, consequences it has? Well, I do think about it. I just don't understand what consequences it has. <laughs> trying to figure it out. And you're going to be writing as a sole author in, in, when you write. Sorry? You're going to be writing as a sole author when you write your papers up, right? Um, I'm assuming I won't be. Okay, so you perhaps have some things to think about there already. Yeah. Anybody else think that that really doesn't apply to them? So there was somebody else who did. Oh, I was just going to make a comment saying. Uh, Can you just speak up because um, it's quite difficult? We're doing a recording, so we want to make sure we don't on the recording. I was just going to say. Um, to that person, but because work is, is theoretical and might not have any practical application, if you nicked someone's work, for example, they'd probably think that was unethical, regardless of whether it was practical or not. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Anybody else wants to profess that ethics is not relevant? No, I mean, I think I think your point is is a good one. That, that I mean, if you are doing mostly theoretical work, it's not immediately obvious why you should be worrying about some of these things. I think you, you 
we've heard from perhaps from some of the, re the replies that actually there, there will come a point at which it does become relevant. But, uh, I mean, Elena, can you, uh, I mean, from the point of view of you know, being a mathematician doing it, it's uh, you know, how is all of this relevant to the people who do the math at the end of the theoretical research? Yeah, it, it's true that there is less, there are fewer things that actually constrain you in ethical terms if you're doing mostly theoretical work. Numbers don't need much protection, symbols don't need much protection, but there's all the things about publication, ethics, collegiality. You're here mixing with other postgraduates, you might hear things which, which you ought to be back to whistleblower on. The various of these things, even in you know quite abstract pure maths, ultimately do have uh, you know real world implications. You know all these things about coding and so on, and should we all be you know, can we crack codes? All that sort of thing. Years ago, people might not think it has any any ethical dimension to it, but there are there are things. Plagiarism. Is there an issue with it? There are also some interesting things, uh, differences in some of these authoring conventions. It's on the border of whether it's ethics or just good practice. But things like understanding pure maths, for instance, it's quite common for all authors to be listed alphabetically, whatever their contribution to the work. Whereas in applied, even something as close as applied maths, it's, it's usually a reflection of amount of work or value of the work. So there are conventions like that which have an ethical dimension and certainly could get you into bad trouble if you're not uh, aware of them. Okay. Um, there's a question related to, uh, to statistics and animal research. Um, so there's a paper that came out last year in Nature which basically found that um, a lot of the studies in neuroscience, and in particular in, in animal research, were severely kind of uh, underpowered statistically, so that you don't really have the ability to detect the sizes or kind of effects they were looking for. Um, and it was it was something like a huge amount, um, uh, and it just kind of makes me worried that they're kind of misinterpreting the kind of the, the, the ethical principle of, of um, using the smallest amount of, of animals. So it's part of the three R's of animal research. Um, where you're supposed to use the minimum number of animals that, that's required. And it seems to me a lot of people are using the smallest amount rather than the smallest amount that would address your research questions in that you, you're trying to find an effect that is, is reliable and reproducible. Um, and I don't really see how um, that can be resolved easily because you have journals publishing this work um, and with the kind of publish or perish culture it seems like it's, it's encouraging scientists to, to violate that kind of ethical principle. So I just wondered what your thoughts were, kind of Pete, with the animal research and <coughs> yourself with the statistics about that. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm on the, uh, one of our ethical reviewing panels for animal research here, where we try to make sure that the work that is proposed is suitably powered. That means not using too many animals, nor using too few, because it's, in some ways it's even more unethical to, uh, to carry out experiments with too few animals, because you really, really stand very little chance of finding, finding any effects, even if they're there. So, I mean, at least for animals, it is protected by home office guidelines, they, like humans, have some legal protection, but it is still sadly true that the level of scrutiny is probably insufficient to stop these problems. I mean, at least at the publication level with human medical trials, most in most of the reputable, the mainstream journals, the big journals, the Lancet, the New England Journal, and so on, they have statistical scrutiny of the methods. That is coming in animal-related research, but it's, it's not uniform yet. And it will be coming in other areas as well. This is something I wanted to bring out today. But those of you doing experiments that are not on people or animals, think you're exempt from these conditions of making experiments efficient. It's not true. I mean, even if all you are wasting is 
your time and somebody's money, it's une unethical to do that. Taxpayers' that, money. Taxpayers, <laughs> my, various people's money, and money that could be better spent. It's the same with failing to write things up. That's another thing that would apply to the pure mathematicians as well. Or being too slow. It's You need to be slow enough to be careful, but you, don't, you shouldn't be failing to report research. It is your ethical duty to carry through the whole process, right through to the publication, even if that's publishing a sort of negative result. It hasn't demonstrated what you what you hoped. It's still worth other people knowing that because it's it stops them wasting their time and <coughs> doing the same thing again. Um, or if it is true, it gives them a chance to validate it, substantiate it, and the whole field to move forward. I mean, I, I th if, if, the paper, if you're referring to the paper I think you're referring to, which is um, a one about uh, uh, motor neuron disease, ALS, it was a, maybe it wasn't, but there was a big paper last year by a guy called Steve Perrin in the States, um, actually perhaps taking a slightly different approach, which was to look at, I think it was about uh, 15 or so drugs that had looked very promising in preclinical trials, and then when they got into human trials, they crashed and they were completely, uh, they, they proved not to be useful at all. And many of the people who were arguing against animal experimentation were using that as an argument to say, um, there's no point in doing the animal trials, it's just a lottery, it's not showing you anything about human outcomes. Whereas these guys actually went uh, and analyzed the literature and then set up the trials again and showed that if they'd been done properly in the first place, they would have predicted exactly what happened in humans. So um, the business about underpowering things, about using noisy systems, about um, not being careful about you know, controlling whether you're comparing males and females, all those things are incredibly important. And you're absolutely right. I mean, we, sh we should not be just pushing numbers down. We should be using precisely the right amount of, of, uh, of power. And actually, I think the very fact that those, obviously, two papers have come out in the recent times is heightening the awareness of this. People are not going to put money into research that is not going to be sufficiently powered now. There's a, there's a, a much greater acute awareness of, of this, I think. In fact, I'm involved in an EU-wide study where we're analysing how journals, for example, take into account uh, animal welfare and experimental design in their process of peer review. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I think you make a very good point, and I think it, it's, uh, it, it, it's uh, an incredibly important aspect of this. Um, <coughs> given what you're saying about the, the pressure to publish in large journals like Nature, and if that's if that's causing a, a culture problem in science where people are being pressured to be bad to publish in these these very large journals, uh, is there not a kind of a collective ethical uh, imperative on science to try to change that culture and publish more papers in, in open access journals, or somehow, somehow change the uh, the way that that's perceived so that that pressure doesn't exist? There are lots and lots of journals, and they all get ranked according to their impact factor. Some of the psychology journals have impact factors of 0.5 or 0.6, and nature and science have impact factors of 30-something. Um, it is just the case that more and more Administrators, fireers and firers, they're busy people. If you have papers published in the glamour magazines, it makes their job easier. And that's, that's what happens. It's, it's even worse, actually it's worse than I've made out, because in order to get a paper published, in one of science for nature. The last paper I reviewed for, for nature had 17 supplementary figures. Okay? You're allowed to publish four figures in, in the journal article, but you're allowed to publish a whole stack of stuff as supplementary information. Um, 
in my area, the way you get data published, your paper published in science or nature, is to have the problem that you are addressing at several levels of description. So you might have some microbiology genetics at the bottom level, you have some electrophysiology or anatomy at the intermediate level, and you will have a behavioral part of the study at the top level. Which means, more and more, only the big labs or the big collaborating labs can get their work into these journals. The, the, the lone, the small investigator in their own lab doing really good work on a, at a, a single level will <coughs> have real trouble getting into these journals. That said, though, I think it's important to realise that, you know, we just talked about these papers in analysing the way the animal experiments are done. You may be aware of the, um, actually what was a tragedy about the, uh, the, the so-called STAP stem cell methodology, where it was thought that just by stressing any cell type, you could produce stem cells, and that turned out to be, well, there was problems with the data, and the, and the paper was eventually withdrawn. And there is an element of, of self-leveling in this. Um, nature is going to take quite a big rap from that stem cell story because they let it go through when they knew that the re reviewers were, were actually telling them it shouldn't go through. Um, I've said that in public, I've said it on the camera, I'm probably going to get sued. Um, <laughs> there is evidence to suggest, allegedly, that that is the case. <laughs> But I think it's an important part of science that we, we do self-regulate. Um, the, the open access journals are indeed becoming more, more, more accessible, more uh, popular with people to publish in. Uh, the success of PLOS, the PLOS uh, journals, for example, uh, Nature itself has Nature Communications. There's a whole bunch coming on. So I think, although Pete, I think, presented a fairly realistic and a little bit grim picture there, the reality is that science actually self-regulates itself, and over time things are changing. So don't be too depressed by that. I think you know, it, we also have to recognise that I think biology, uh, and I know there's a whole bunch of other disciplines here, but biology is going through the kind of revolution that chemistry and physics have done in the past. And of course, in physics and in chemistry, there's big science labs that have been around for, for ages. We look at CERN and so on. So you know, we are having to collaborate much more to get significant publications out, and I think that's just something that biologists have, in a sense, have got to face up to. Um, but so, but I don't think it's a, a, an entirely gloomy picture. I think people, the, the, the journals, are responsive to the people that use them. They have to be, because people will stop using them, and especially when big <coughs> stuff like the, the stem cell one. A lot, a lot of the funding agencies are now stipulating that you have to publish open access to and obviously that's a, a very good move. Um, it's difficult because they have to provide money to allow you to do that because the open access journals need somehow to support themselves and that requires that you have to pay some contribution to it. Some so, contribution? Two grand? Yeah. <laughs> so you write it, you write it into a grant, and the taxpayer pays. So that's fair, isn't it? The self-regulation is happening. I mean, the big game example there of the evils of X-ray crystallography. Well, I'm an X-ray crystallographer, um, and yes, our field has been littered in the last two or three years with some very high-profile cases of fabrication of data. But the reason it was found is because another group of X-ray crystallographers realised the data must be fabricated, and they actually searched through the data and did a curry cuff analysis of the data and proved. It was wrong and published to say, you know, this is a fabrication and got that person pulled out. And yes, there's been a long, drawn out case following on from that, is when the supervisor claimed that nothing to do with him really good, <coughs> and it was all the students' fault, and the students were the supervisor's fault. But eventually, the case came out, so we did stop it. So it does happen, it's not, and, and, but it's your duty as well to whistle blow on colleagues. I, I think this is really important because actually that's the way that science works anyway. People pop up ideas, um, they, 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 they throw up hypotheses, they do some testing, but no amount of testing is ever going to ultimately definitively prove a hypothesis, notwithstanding the mathematicians, 
Um, because there's always the possibility that somebody will come along later and disprove it. The problem we've got is that neuroscience is so such a high profile in society, which we think we're quite pleased about compared to 30 years ago, but it comes at a cost, which is that the public is on to what's being published very quickly, and it spreads around very quickly, and it becomes fact in a way that we don't really intend it to be very quickly. And then when it doesn't, then when later it proves not to be fact, we've got to answer to the public about why this thing was in that journal Nature, and actually it's wrong. So we have to be very careful, and you have to think about how you interact with the public. I'm not saying you shouldn't, you definitely should be interacting with the public. But explaining how science works is an incredibly important thing for you to do. You know, think hard about whether or not you've ever really proven a hypothesis. Isn't it always possible that somebody, again, notwithstanding the theoretical physicists and the mathematicians who have their own framework to think about, but in empirical science, it's always possible that somebody will come up with a different interpretation that might actually say that the way you thought about it to begin with was wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. That is part of the way it works. So we have, in some cases, we have people doing it fraudulently, but a lot, a lot, a lot of the time, things are published, and actually the interpretation that was put on it was, was just the wrong interpretation. And somebody comes along better with a better one, and that's how things get refined. So we have to think about that very hard when we explain what we do to the public. Other questions, comments? Um, so for the first time, the EU and the World Health Organization are ensuring that all clinical trial data are published by drug companies, um, regardless of whether the drugs went to market or not. Um, in basic and translational research, should we be aiming to um, make negative data statistically significant so we can publish it? Um, and is there any stigma against people who publish negative data? Uh, well, there is. Uh, you can argue whether there should be. This is why it's a revolution for this type of thing to be happening. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if other people know there have been uh, some high profile cases recently of large drug companies failing, setting up studies, and then when they don't show the, the benefits they, they hoped for, they just fail to publish that material and to make that data available. And, and the real harm for that is not only that, that they've wasted their time, but that other people might go down the same route looking at the same drug or similar drugs again in, uh, and wasting it. These things are hugely, hugely expensive, developing drugs this is hugely expensive and difficult. Uh, and so there are now going to be requirements. And there are already requirements to register clinical trials, so it has been possible for people to discover when the, when the results of these have not been reported, but it's now being required that people must deposit these negative or neutral findings. Um, I mean, yes. Yes, it's a, good, it's a good idea. I mean, people shouldn't be doing studies anyway that don't have the power to find effects if they're there. So the implication, typical implication that is made is if you don't find one, that's because there isn't one. So that is, that is in some sense a positive finding. Uh, so, so it shouldn't be, I mean, it, it really should never be the case that experiments are insufficiently by, uh, powered to find at least a minimally interesting result. And I would think it was quite nice if all these things were available, but there are substantial commercial confidentiality type pressures uh, that will make that very difficult in all except the most strongly regulated environments like clinical trials, I would guess. But it, it might come eventually. Isn't one of the big problems for negative data is that the reviewers <laughs> of the study having a <coughs> they must have done something wrong. They must have done they 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 haven't they've overlooked something that they don't know about. And that's always the problem with negative data. Well, 
and it might be true. And it might well be true. And that's why. Uh, uh, so you so generally, it's examples. very, very difficult to get negative data. We did the study, and we expected to find, as a result of uh, this background material, we were expecting to find this, and we didn't. It does depend a little bit on how you present it, because you can actually turn a story like that into a positive thing. You can say, we thought that this was going to be the outcome, and actually it's this. Yeah. yeah. But and that and means, therefore, to, that this... Uh, yeah. to, re to refine your experiment and think more closely about it. You, you, you have to have some controls <coughs> which show that if there was, that your dependent measure is sufficiently sensitive. It's very hard That's to the prove problem. a negative is the point. That's it's exactly it's right. almost impossible to, to prove a negative, but the way science works is to say that this is our continuing default hypothesis until we have reason to move to something different. And that's why, for instance, in statistics, the, the way you, you, you've set the problem up to choose between two alternatives which are not treated symmetrically. But don't hold your breath <coughs> waiting for negative data to get published in all the, all the top journals. I think there is another point, actually, which is that, of course, there's money involved, uh, particularly for the pharmaceutical companies. When they have a trial that doesn't work, it's not just that it doesn't work and that's disappointing, it's, it didn't work, their share price goes through the floor and their shareholders are all bailing out. So you know, they want to deal with something like that as quickly as possible. They're not going to spend ages proving that it's absolutely, definitely negative because that costs a hell of a lot of money and in the meantime, they're just encouraging their shareholders to, to bail out. And I think that's also true in basic science. I mean. We're not getting funded to spend hours proving that something isn't the case, which is an unfortunate fact of life. But uh, when you're living with limited resources, you have to make some decisions about when something ceases to be worth pursuing. And, and, and that, I think, you have to be pragmatic about that. Can I ask you, Father, what do you think is the biggest challenge for young researchers starting their career about research? What, what is it that they really have to, you know, to look out and uh, wanting Resist. to become the best. Resisting the pressure of the supervisor probably is your biggest challenge. <laughs> the supervisor's hypothesis that they desperately want you to come out you into the lab and you're going to show that this is the case and then you get the set of results as feature for how they just don't match the supervisor. And that's so <coughs> that will be your biggest pressure. Avoid your supervisor's hypothesis or resist your supervisor's hypothesis until they're actually proven right. And that, I think, is your one. I think I'd add to that that the, the, probably the best way to, to, to deal with that situation is to be creative, is to come up with another interpretation that you can test and come up with experiments that will test it and find other ways to prove that your idea actually is the right one and the supervisors, you know, because they'll like the creativity of that. You, you'll have a new story to tell. So it's not just that you're proving them wrong. It's actually you thought of, if it isn't that, if it isn't what the supervisors thought about, well then there must be some other explanation. Come up with that explanation. Be creative about it. Think about how to prove it. And if you do all of that, your supervisor will appreciate it enormously. So I, I think there's there's some some interpersonal skills to be worked on there. I think, I think I'd extend the same, the same one again in a slightly different direction, which is don't believe necessarily that what they tell you to do about the best way to, to prove or otherwise this hypothesis is right either. So they may be out of date with <laughs> certain things. Uh, I'm thinking here particularly about <laughs> statistics. I mean, they may well have been taught their statistics 30 years ago. If they, and were, if they were taught statistics. If they were taught statistics at all. And even so, statistics has moved on a long way in, in 30 years. Uh, and it isn't only the supervisor. It's, it's the postdocs. It's the literature. Don't just blindly assume that doing what the previous person did is the right way to go about addressing this problem. It might well be. It, I'm not saying it, it's, I mean, very rarely would it be completely stupid. But I think a critical look at things before you go down some incredibly lengthy 
experimental puff is definitely worthwhile, so think carefully about it. Because in the end, I mean, if it's, if it's, if it's going to be your work, you that's going to own the result, you want it to have been proved or established in a reputable manner. You don't want to get right through to the publication and then have the referees or competitor researchers criticising what you've done, you want to think of those problems up front. So again, don't, don't believe the supervisor. Uh, <laughs> We're going to be... I'm sure it's been lynched. <laughs> 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 so, there was a question. Yeah, so somebody uh, uh, wrote a question down. Um, and, and, and actually it relates to a few of the things that we've been talking about, which it says, as, an, as undergraduates, we submitted our essays and work into Turn It In. Uh, I, how many of you did that? Yeah, well, good. it's becoming prevalent all over the place. In fact, your thesis will be submitted to turn it in at the end, so it's everywhere. Um, so it's a, it's a plagiarism checker. So the question is, do PIs not have an equivalent plagiarism checker for grant proposals, and if not, why not? I think I'd say they do. It's the colleagues on the grant panel and the reviewers who are anyway trying to tear you to pieces. <coughs> So I don't think you should have any fear that, we're, that we have to worry about that sort of thing. I think it's something that, that happens, a grant panel particularly, because the competition for money is so hard that uh, people will find every excuse to take you to pieces. And if it's, uh, and you're being, you know, your work is being presented to uh, other experts in your field who will know what the field has said. And if they don't, and they think that, and they think it smells funny, they will check it out. So I think actually we are subject to massive pressure like that. Uh, and I, I don't think it's, uh, I personally don't think this is a major issue in that respect. The grant review, I can remember a grant review, the guy said, I can't really see what's very new in this proposal. You know, um, it, what Andy says is absolutely right. The, the funding agencies these days are not finding, they're, they're not looking for proposals to fund. They are looking for proposals not to fund because they have way more than they could potentially fund. They are looking for reasons not to fund a proportion of them so that they're left with the proposals that they plan for. Any more questions, comments? Yeah, I might say actually that the, the plagiarism checking at the level of thesis submission is as much for your protection as it is, it is for the universities. Because you don't want to have something out there and then be accused of that. So it's, it, you know, it's a it seems like a painful thing, but actually it's, it's, it's really out there to protect you. It's not trying to catch people out. It's just saying you really don't want to get yourself in a position where somebody can make that accusation. So, yeah, try not to think about that too negatively.